for Martin. He's going to show you how to do it. How are you guys doing? Thank you for coming. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to stop me, raise your hand, and then we could have Calvin bring you a mic and we could ask you a question. That way everybody can hear. If you feel kind of nervous, kind of shy, we're also doing questions at the end. Or I'll be hanging out here at the booth. So if you guys have any questions and you don't want to ask it in front of everybody, feel free to come out. Uh, we can chat. We can hang out. Whatever you guys need, let me know. So my name is Martin. I've been doing weddings for about 14 years. I'm counting. Still my thing. I'm based in Southern California. And I've been taking pictures for about 17 years. Again, still building. It's my passion. So I'm going to probably be doing it forever. Why are we here today? I want to show you guys what I personally bring to the weddings, how I use it, what kind of pictures I get with the stuff that I bring, and hopefully generate some ideas for you guys, maybe give you an idea of how you can use something if you already have it, or if you don't have it, maybe open up your eyes to possibly purchasing it or renting it in the future and adding it into your tool bag. So this our first photography tip of the day. We want to know our gear. We want to know what it can do. You want to be able to take your lens and already know, already be able to predict, I'm going to get this type of picture with this tool. Because the thing is, a lot of people will buy stuff. They'll use it once or twice, and then that's it. They throw it in the bag and they forget about it. First of all, you're wasting your money. Photography stuff is really expensive. And you're wasting your time because you never really use it. Or maybe you don't learn how to use it, so the time that you're pulling it out, you're just getting the ba very, very basics of the item where you could have been taking full advantage of the quality, the consistency, and what it can offer you. So we want to learn our gear. We want to know, we want to trust it. We want to know the capabilities of it. We want to push it to its limits, and we want to know what it can handle. As far as cameras go, cameras, there's going to be different brands, and it's all going to really, really be a personal preference. So what do you like to use? What feels good to you? If you've ever played with a camera, you can go through the menus and see what you're comfortable with. Personally, I shoot Canon. And as my main camera, I'm shooting a Canon R6. As a backup, I'm shooting an EOS R. You always want to carry a backup because you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes the cameras can get affected by weather. So if you go somewhere that's really cold, your batteries might not last as long. Your camera could freeze up. If you don't have a backup, you're probably going to be a little screwed. Good thing about it is a lot of times the guests are going to have something similar to what you have. So worst case, you might be able to bribe one of the guests and to let you borrow their camera. But you always want to be covered on your own. So we want to have a backup. As far as lenses go, these are my, my favorite options, my best options. Shoot a 35 millimeter and an 85 millimeter. For the most part, those are going to be on me 100% of the day. I do shoot primes. and. That's a personal choice. I like the primes because of the speed and the low light performance. So there is a little bit less convenience because you have to carry more stuff. You got to carry a bigger bag. Each lens, for the most part, only has one purpose, one focal length. But once you learn the capabilities, once you know the limits, you're going to know where you can push the lens. And you're going to be able to get predictable results with the lens that you choose. So I'm going to take you guys through my widest lens all the way to my most telephoto lens. And then you guys will be able to see some sample pictures so you can see the range of what we can do with what we have. Sigma fisheye in this. I personally use Sigma. I do like the cost to quality ratio. I feel that it has a good price and it has a good quality. And really for the price, you're not really going to be able to beat it. I have used Canon lenses before, usually paying about double the price. But again, the quality is really going to be there. And if you care about the top, top quality, you definitely want to go with your native company lens. But if maybe you can't afford it, but you want something that covers that uh, angle, Sigma might be a good option. So I do use the Sigma fisheye. Now, you do want to keep in mind that it does distort. It's an extreme wide angle. So I could be holding my camera to my face, and I could see the ceiling. I could also see my feet without moving. So I conscious of it, and I'm usually leaning a little forward so that I can avoid that. But again, I already know that I'm going to see it, so ahead of time, I'm already leaning a little forward. I like to use it a lot for my group shots, and this is something that I try to do at every wedding. One of the biggest benefits to the group shot, 
this combination of people is never going to be in the same place ever again in their life. So you can have a reunion wedding or a vow renewal in 20 years, but you're not going to get the same exact people there. So that's is a really good souvenir for the couple. Plus, if you're working together with the DJ, I usually have him call everyone to the dance floor. You're going to do a couple pictures, throw your hands up, and then he's throwing out, you know, suavemente or whatever you guys is, have as the opener, and then it's party from there to the end. Really, really good for bringing your whole scene in. So, again, it does take everything that you see more or less into the sensor. So you can get the ceiling. You could also get the floor. So I like to use it for churches. A lot of times the couple is going to spend a lot of time, a lot of money picking out the church. They might like it because they've been there their whole lives or been going there their whole lives. Or they picked it for the architecture. It looks really nice. So the fisheye is really good for bringing in the whole scene. And then you squeeze everything into the picture. So it's really nice for that. And if you want to add a lot of extra stuff in your picture, you want to bring in the environment. So here we have the Dancing on the Clouds. I'm not sure it's really popular over here, but in California, pretty much every wedding has the Dance in the Clouds. And that's something that's really big right now. And the sparklers as well. Something that I wouldn't be able to get with something that's a little more tight, a 35, maybe a 24. You could probably squeeze it in if you have the room. But right here, I mean, the couple's probably where the computer is. And I'm getting everything in there, including the sparkler. Maybe if you have an ugly venue, you could probably stay away from the fisheye because you're going to be able to see all that in there. Moving on a little bit, we're going to zoom in a little bit more to the 24. And again, the primes, I like to use the primes because it's going to be a 1.4. If you're shooting a wedding, you're always in low light. There's never enough light, so you want to have as wide as aperture as you can so that we can take advantage of all the light that's in the available room, the ambient light. Also really good for your group pictures. So in this scenario here, we definitely had space. We had room. But we had a similar setup here where we have chairs. Behind them, there's water. So obviously, I can't push them back. Sometimes the venue can be accommodating, and they'll let you move some stuff around. But people never tend to put it back. So they're getting a little strict with you can't move anything that they've already set up. So this is where my 24 came in. I'm standing right here. The group is here. I can shoot them with the 24 and just kind of lift it up a little bit. And I'm able to cut out all the chairs so you don't see anything in the bottom. If I'm on a 35, I'm going to have to back up a little bit. And I'm going to be able to see more of the chairs. So either you're photosh photoshopping it or you're cropping it, but you're probably cropping them at the knees. So really good for that. Right here, I'm up against the wall. Didn't have enough space. So I, it, I had a couple of options. I either squeeze everybody in a little bit closer, but then it's going to start looking too cluttered. Could go fisheye, but fisheye, again, really, really wide. And then towards the ends, it's going to bow a little bit. So definitely a lot more distortion. But the 24 is an easy fix using your lens presets on Lightroom. So distorts a little bit along the edges, but it's going to be good enough for a group. And once you crop it in a little bit, you don't really see the distortion too much. Let's go ahead and move it in just a little bit more. Again, one of my top two lenses, my, one of my favorite lenses, the 35. 35 is a little bit what I would call medium. A little bit wide, a little bit zoomed in. So it gives you an option, if, again, if your venue is maybe not too nice, the location is not too nice, you don't have to get as much. It's easier to fill the frame. Really like it for my group shots. And maybe 80 to 90% of the day, I'm having a 35 on my camera. Really good for group shots. I can fit some of the venue in there. So if I want to uh, show off you know, the trees, architecture, or anything like that, I can take advantage of that with the 35. Doesn't really distort too much. So this doesn't have the lens preset, but the lines are straight, and everything looks good. Their heads aren't stretched out. Their feet aren't extra long. So this is really good mid-range uh, lens. And I do get questions about if, I gonna get, if I'm going to be getting my first lens, what should I go with? I always recommend a 35 or a 50. Again, a little bit more zoomed in, and we'll go into a 50 right now. But a 35 is definitely going to be the way to go if you don't have any primes. Same thing showing the group. 35, the Sigma 35 is also a pretty decent, what I would call medium macro. So it does let you come in a little bit closer. So if you have a macro lens, but you don't have time to go to your bag and grab it, you only have the 35 on you, something small pops up. Hey, I have this little 
uh, detail that I want you to get really quick, but I, there's not enough time. I could just put the 35 or if I have it on already, I'm able to get close and I'm able to get some detail shots without having to switch the lens. So that's one of the big benefits of that as well. We could do outdoor shots. Again, with the 1.4, we could do indoor shots. These are all natural lighting. This venue did have an open side, so we were getting a lot of light from there. We're really, really good for that. You can use it as a wide angle. All you got to do is move yourself back a little bit. You could also move yourself up a little bit closer and get a little bit more closer, a little bit more telephoto type look. So it's very versatile. Again, the lines are really straight, no distortion. So really good for architecture and putting your couples in situations where there's going to be a lot of straight lines. You want to keep them straight. Sigma 50. And now the 50 millimeter is really, really popular when it comes to photography. If you've been taking pictures for a while, you already know that the 50 is really close to what we see with our eyes. So kind of what your, your eyes see as far as focal length goes, that's what the 50 millimeter is going to try to match. It looks really natural because it's something that we're already kind of used to seeing. I like using the 50 for our entrances. Biggest reason, it's zoomed in a little more than the 35, so I don't have to crop as much. And again, I don't have to be as close to the couple. I don't have to be in the way as much. I want to let everything happen as it's natural, you know, as it's regularly set up to go. So I want to stay a little out of the way. So right here, I'm just standing in the front, a little to the side. I'm able to get the bride, and I don't have to crop her, you know, being super small. I can just crop in a little bit if I need to. And as they start coming in a little closer, I don't have to move super far away. You can pretty much stay in one spot and get a couple different looks. Again, if you have the ugly venue, you can crop out some stuff a little bit easier. It's easier to fill the frame with the couple or with your subject. And it's really good for the exes as well, so I don't have to be as close to them. If you're shooting with a videographer also, you don't have to be in their way. So a lot of times you're going to be working together with photo teams, video teams. You might have a second shooter. If you're on a really wide angle, you have to be really close to fill your frame, and you just get in the way of everything. They're going to have their video with the bride and groom, and then you're going to be their special guest in all the pictures. So we want to pull back a little bit to give room for everybody to put their shots together. Really good for night shots. Again, since it's 1.4, we can bring up our ambient light. And if you shoot venues that have up lighting, you could really bring a lot of the colors with your wider apertures. So that's really nice for that. And we're getting medium telephoto shots. So again, standing more or less in the back of the aisle, I could zoom in in a little bit with the 50 and I could get very natural looking shots. Zooming in a little bit closer, and this is what I would call a specialty lens, the Sigma Macro. It's not something that everybody has, and I would say maybe not something that everybody needs, but something that I personally like to have. A lot of times your couples, your brides, your grooms, spending a lot of time, spending a lot of money with their details, their rings, bouquet charms, a lot of times the little details are going to be really meaningful to them, and that's where this is going to come in. The macro lets us come in really close to capture the details of the details. So, you know, right here, she's putting on the ring. You know, a really nice shot. We get to show off the ring as well. I usually like doing ring shots. Again, they spend a lot of time picking these things out. So I want to be able to show it off. And these pictures right here are really meaningful to them. Usually they're putting pictures of their loved ones on their bouquet. So again, we want to capture that. You do want to keep in mind with the macro, even though it's a 2.8, the specific lens is 2.8, the closer you get to your subject, the shallower the depth of field. So here I'm really close, probably about an inch away from the rings. So I'm only able to get the details in the front ring and the groom's ring. But if I move back maybe two inches, I'm able to get both of the rings in detail. So that's where you get to be creative. You get to put the look that you want. So I want to focus only on the groom's ring. I only want to focus on the bride's ring. That's a choice. That's a stylistic choice that now you can make. We're also getting the ring shots by themselves. And sometimes the grooms will have cuff links or necklaces or little charms as well that we don't want to leave out. And again, they're there for a reason. Any, anything the bride, the groom spend any time or any money on, I usually want to capture so that we can go ahead and save that for them. No, this is actual, the groom had 
uh, cufflink with pictures of his grandma. So we definitely wanted to get pictures of it. Because the thing is, the cufflinks or some of the charms could get lost throughout the day. Not that we want them to, but it happens. If we have a picture, it's something that we can maybe save a little bit longer. You could definitely have duplicates, backups, whereas cufflinks, you might just have one pair and then that's kind of it. So again, whatever they spend any time, any energy on, we want to be able to capture it for them. Sigma 85, and this is my second favorite top two tied together with a 35. This is gonna be a lens that's on me 100% of the day as well. So this is my portrait lens. This is kind of my go-to for separation. So if I wanna blur out the background, if I'm doing my portraits, this is gonna be my go-to. Gives me a little bit of focal length, so I'm definitely able to make the separation, blur out the backgrounds, but I don't have to be super far. So right here where our camera is, maybe take a step or two back and I could get their full body. I could get decent blur in the background and I'm still able to talk to them. A lot of times at the wedding, there's a lot of stuff going on. So I don't wanna be too far away where I can't communicate with the couple. I can't let them know how to pose, I can't direct them. So the 85 is a good medium telephoto where again, we're gonna get the blurry backgrounds, we're gonna get the professional look that even some of our newer technology smartphones will try to mimic, but you can actually create it on your own. Similarly to the macro, the closer that you get to the couple, the blurrier the background gets. So if I'm coming in for like a bo uh, half body shot, the background's gonna blur a lot more. If I wanna show a little bit more of the background, I can step back and the background will become less ambiguous. You'll be able to see a little bit more. So you get to play with that as well. Use your creativity however you want. And I'll have an example of how that's gonna look. Get the get the blurry backgrounds. So right here, I'm playing with a little bit with my depth of field. I have it out, I believe it's gonna be about a 1.8, and I wanna see just a little bit of the groom. I do have them move in a little bit, and right here, same aperture, same settings. I'm able to get both of them in focus. So I bring them into the same line, same field of view, and I'm able to get both of them in focus even though my aperture is low. I'm able to blur out some of the backgrounds. So if we have something distracting, over here, we had a bunch of cars, a parking lot. So this is really the only direction we could shoot. So we just dropped it to 1.4. They're in the same plane. So they're both gonna be in focus. And I'm able to move a little bit further back to get the veil in. And then we're blurring out the background so that we're not too distracted with, looks to be like a power generator or something in the background. Definitely a big advantage if you know how to blur your background because a lot of times the wedding is not gonna be, the wedding venue might be nice on the inside but maybe on the outside might not be the nicest. They don't focus a lot of times their energy into what the outside looks like, just what the inside looks like. And here we're gonna have an example of how we can control the blurriness of the background by just moving. So I have the groom here, I'm doing a half body shot, probably around 1.8. If we can see the background, we see shapes, we see colors, but. It, I'm just moving a couple steps back so I can get his full body, and then we're able to see more of the background elements. I could tell there's like a little fence right there, there's some trees, there's some rose bushes. Uh, we're over here, just a little bit more orbs, a little bit more bokeh. Right here, I'm a little bit further back where I can get their full body, and I could tell that there's trees back here. So there's a little bit of blur so that they separate. You don't lose them in the background, but we can distinguish them. We have them in the front, they're sharp, and the background is just gonna separate a little bit. Really good for entrances as well, if you can't be too close. And some churches won't let you be right at the front, so you have to pull a little bit further back. You don't wanna do, do that with a 35 or with a 24, because they're gonna be tiny in the frame. And then when you come into crop, it's gonna have to stretch out a lot. Not a huge deal with some of these newer cameras, because they have the higher megapixels, but if the groom really decides that he wants a 20 by 30 of that picture, you're gonna be kinda screwed, because you're not gonna have the resolution. The 135, this is gonna be the longest lens that I personally own. And for a while, this was my favorite lens. Um, I do like it because of the zooming. So again, if I have space, I like to use the lens. It gives me a really good separation from the background again, even better than the 85. Even though this is a, a F2, to get blurrier backgrounds. The only thing is the distance. My couple has to be super far. 
And if you're looking right here, you guys look behind you where the PPA sign is. That's probably where I have my couple with the 135. So the distance, I'm yelling at them or I'm trying to give them hand signals like, hey, do this, hey, try this. But you get a lot of loss in communication. They're not as close. I can't tell them, hey, feel like this, hey, try this. I'm telling them that I'm running over there and I'm trying to take two, three pictures and then running back. So there's a lot of movement. Really good for exercise though. So if you want to get your workout in, you want to get your steps, it's going to be good for that because you're going to have to walk back and forth a lot. But as I'm coming in, the background is going to get even blurrier. And again, just without changing my settings, it's all F2, 135. Just coming in a little bit closer and the background's going to blur a little more. So his question was, when would I choose the, eight, the 135 over the 85? Really, I would say personally for me, it would be to blur out the background more. Compression, so that's one of the things also. The, the longer your focal length, so the more your lens, lens is zoomed in, you could actually give the effect of bringing your subject or your background a little bit closer to your subject. So that's one of the biggest benefits of the telephoto, as opposed to like the wide angle, the wide angle kind of separates. So if you have your couple in the front and you want to make your background seem a lot further, we're going wide angle. But if we see some cool buildings in the back, we want to bring them a little bit closer, we're going telephoto. So the higher the telephoto, the more close that, that background is going to get. So that would be the reason. 7200 is really great as well. And that's a good option, but it's usually a 2.8. So if you're in low light, then that's where uh, your 135 is the F2, so it's going to be a better choice for that. Also, the blurrier background, you know, with the wider aperture. So that's going to be the reason. Um, I like the speed of the, you know, 7200, but sometimes the weight is also a lot heavier. Right here, we're using some of the compression to kind of make it look like, you know, all the stack all the layers together. Again, the distance here, they're probably a little bit further out probably by the Canon booth, and I'm running back to, get the, to fit them in there with the 135. So the exercise component is still there, but I get really nice half body shots as well if I'm moving in a little bit closer. This is going to be, the, I guess, one of the biggest benefits and one of the reasons that I personally would choose a 135. I'm able to bring my lighting a lot closer. So right here, I have my light probably like right here, only a couple feet away. Two benefits, you don't have to turn it up as bright. As opposed to if I'm using a, a wide angle, my light is way over here. My light is here, but my view is way over here. So then I'm actually uh, photoshopping it out or taking my plate shot and then, you know, using my, my clone tool to try to photoshop it out. With the telephoto, I could automatically just cut it without doing any photoshop. So if you hate photoshopping, keeping our light close, it recycles a lot faster, and we can compress the bracket and blur it out a little bit. For lighting, really, really important for the weddings. I'm using Godox V1s. I like the round head. It just spreads the light a little bit better, a little bit more evenly. You don't really get too many hot spots, and I'm usually putting the dome on it. it spreads it out a little bit more. It's gonna soften it a little bit. Really similar to maybe like a Gary Fong or um, the Magmods, MagSphere, but this is going to be brand specific to the Godox, and it's going to be on a magnet, so it just clicks on there. Whenever the flash is on my camera, the dome is on my camera as well. For off-camera lighting, Godox AD200s, and I usually have three of these. Um, well, I have my backpack, world, which I call my lighting bag, where I have my three off-camera flashes, and I have my uh, stand adapters, and my modifiers. So usually it's going to be the dome, a couple gels, a couple grids. I'm setting up two lights at every reception. So if we imagine our dance floor, I'm setting up one light by the DJ and trying to hide it, kind of like in between the speakers. First of all, not as many people go back there, so I don't have to worry about it getting knocked over. But sometimes I'll have like a cable tie where I can just tie it to one of the speakers and then it's going to weigh it down a lot. So again, makes it a little bit more secure. And then I'll take my other light and I'll put it in the opposite corner, usually behind the table 
or somewhere where I could kind of hide it a little bit, maybe behind a curtain. And then that's going to give me the cross lighting. And I have the third flash on my camera, kind of filling in all the shadows, which would be the V1. My third AD200, I'm using it as my accessory. And I just call it like my bonus light. This is going to be my mobile light. So I have it on a stand. I have it ready to go, kind of off to the side. But if we're moving somewhere else, we're going to go over here and do the cake. I don't have to take down one of my other lights. I just take my third one. It's already ready to set. Take it over here, light up the cake, do a couple shots. Oh, wait, you want to go outside? Cool. I have my light ready. Again, I don't have to tear anything down. I don't have to mess with any settings. My third light's ready to go. We go outside. We get our pictures. And that's where the, the benefit of the third one's going to come in. Sometimes you have a fourth one if you like. But I feel like for me, when I'm shooting outside, I'm shooting maybe two lights max, external flash or off-camera flash. But one... Um, AD200 is definitely going to take care of your needs for that. As far as trigger goes, I'm using the Godox R2. And I think this might be an a Autorama exclusive, because on Amazon I was only able to find a R1. B&H also, I think, only carries an R1. But what I like about the R2 is it has the groups on an individual button. You get a little bit more control. And this is going to let you do up to five groups where your on-camera flash will still let you control your other lights, but it only gives you four groups, sometimes only three. So since I'm setting up five lights, usually my on-camera flash is going to be group A, so I can control it individually. My light that's by the DJ, that one's always group B. So that I already know, hey, this light over here needs to come up a little bit. I automatically go to B. I can turn that up. The opposite light is always C. My accessory light is always going to be D. So again, Everything is running gun. You're grabbing stuff. You're moving settings. You want to be able to keep everything consistent so that if you need to make changes, you already know what to do. So that's always D. And if I have like a AD300, which I'll bring sometimes for like more daytime type stuff, that one's always E. So I already know again. If I have that light, it's E. I know what setting I need to change if I need to. Just some examples of some uh, off-camera flash that I've done with AD200s. Right here we have one in the back, and we have one. Uh, right here, just cross lighting them. And then I have a V1 on my camera filling in some of the shadows. Over here is my setup with the two lights. And I have 8200 over here in this corner. And then over here by the DJ, we have our main one. And then again, just filling them in with the V1. And the V1, I'm shooting manual, usually about 1 over 128. And I'm controlling my brightness of the, or the intensity of the light with the uh, um, ISO. So that helps me bring up a little bit of the ambient light. So if they have any up lights or any ambient setup, I'm not blowing it up with just a bunch of light coming in. I'm controlling it with my ISO. Same thing here. So th these types of lights, if I'm just flashing them super bright, I'm going to be losing a lot of the stuff in the back. But if I'm able to bring up my ISO a little bit, turn down my lights a little bit, I can bring a little bit more of the background in. And these are the types of bags that I use. Not well, not this specific rolling case, because I think the one that I have is already uh, discontinued. But I'm usually shooting a side bag. My preference, the Think Tank Vision 15. I have it on my side with a 35, with the 85. And the third slot, because it's going to hold three lenses, the third slot is the accessory or the optional, the Hail Mary lens. So depending on the situation, if we're doing the ceremony, it's either going to be the 50, or if it's a church that's not going to give me too much space to move around, probably shooting the 135. So I'm going to take assessment of my situation and see where the gap's going to need to be filled, and that's where I pick, pick my lens. If we're doing getting ready, and I already know it's going to be in a hotel, they have a big bridal party, I'm probably throwing a 24 in there instead because I'm going to be tight on space, and I know I'm going to have to capture a big scene. As far as the luggage goes, keep everything in here so I have my backup camera. And I'll usually set it up in a spot where I call my camp. So I'm setting up my camp by the DJ. Again, he could watch it for me and hopefully keep people from going in there. But if I need anything, if I need to change my lens, I could run to the camp, change my lens out really quick. And I try to make my decision ahead of time so that I already know, hey, I'm going to be shooting a lot of wide angle these next couple minutes. So let me just throw the 24 in there. Every once in a while, I'll take the 85 and I'll dump it in there. Maybe at the end of the day, the bag's getting a little too heavy. And I already know, hey, we're doing a lot of dancing stuff right now. So I might not need the 85. So I'll you know, download it in there for a couple minutes. But I have everything here. I have extra batteries, extra memory cards, 
everything that I need is all in one spot, and I don't have to be carrying 50 bags with everything. Everything is in one, one location. Personally, I use the EF lenses. And again, this is going to be a personal choice because Canon does have the new RF lenses. But biggest thing was cost for me. I already had a bunch of EF lenses. All I had to do was get an adapter. It's also really easy for me. As I'm changing lenses, I don't have to worry about, hey, is this an RF lens? Hey, is this an EF lens? This is not all mixed up. I already know I could just grab the lens, put it in my back, or put it on my camera without even looking, and I don't have to worry because I know the adapter's on the camera. I now use this one that has the, the dial that you can adjust, and I'll have it set to um, manual color balance. So I could just set in my Kelvin through there, and I usually lock it on the camera so I don't move it on accident, but it's worked out really well for me. I've also used the one that doesn't have the dial, and I like that one also, but I don't get the Kelvin control. So I go up for this, and I just have one on my camera, and I could you know, just grab whatever lens from my bag. I know it's going to fit on there. At some point, I might go to RF, but then I'll have to change everything out, and everything will have to be new. Question that I also get always, um, how often should I upgrade? Should I upgrade every time a camera comes out, every time a lens comes out? I would say this is a personal choice, but I try to upgrade my camera after I do three shutter replacements. Doesn't really matter why the three shutters, because right now I have the R6, and if I remember correctly, the R6 is supposed to give you about 300,000 actuations. My shutter actually went out at about 100,000. So luckily, it was still under warranty, and Canon was able to switch it out for me at no cost. But that's already going to be one strike on that camera. If I have to replace it again at this year, that'll be two. The third time, I'll probably replace it and then sell it and upgrade to the next thing. Again, that's a personal choice. Um, the 5D Mark IV I had for about six years, and I actually kept that through five shutter replacements. But I was comfortable with it, and I didn't want to make the switch to the EOS R at the point. So I decided I'm going to hold on to it a little bit longer. Not, it wasn't really like a dumb move, because I would still take it every year to Canon to get checked out and to get a shutter replacement. So the maintenance was being done on it. But the camera is going to be like a car. The more you use it, the more wear and tear that's going to be going on on the internal components. And even though we're getting new shutters, this is not really the only moving part. So we want to make sure that we stay on top of our gear because you don't want to be at a wedding and, it ha and have it fail on you. For lenses, lenses do tend to last a little bit longer, and that's why they're going to be a better investment. So you can have a really um, OK camera, but if you have a really good lens, you're going to hold on to it a lot longer. And normally, if you upgrade to a different uh, level of camera, you'll still be able to use the same lens with adapters and stuff. So it's really nice if you invest your money there, you'll be getting a lot more pictures. And I do take my cameras at least once a year to get clean, to get checked out, and make sure the uh, software, the firmware is all up to date on that. Now I'm going to go over uh, three reasons why Zeno is my favorite lab and they're the people that brought me here today. Biggest benefit to Zeno. Their products are up to 50% cheaper than they are somewhere else. So if you need any type of prints, any type of books, we got that covered for you. Bigger or bigger savings on the product means you can make more money when you turn around and sell that to your customers. I can buy everything I need here. So I can buy prints, I can buy books, I can buy albums, I can buy wall art all in one stop shop. And they have all the tools you need. So they have tools to create your stuff, they have tools to share it, and they have tools to sell it. Margins matter, so I can get all of this for $117. I'm getting the flash drive, I'm getting the case, and I'm getting the book. And we have samples of them over here, so if you want to check them out. We also have book collections, print collections, and we have wall arts that we also have on display if you want to check them out as well. These are some of the things that I order and some of the things that I usually include in my packages. Big prints. We want to be able to, sh you know, when we, we spent all day with this couple, we took some pictures, we, they look really nice, we want to be able to show them off, so we want to display them really big. I like the metal prints and I also like the acrylic prints. Flash drives with the case, you can personalize it, you put their pictures on there, and then you put their pictures in the flash drive so they have somewhere nice to keep it, and it gives it more value than just give them a random flash drive from a no-name brand. And the albums. And this is going to be our software. We have our software to design, so that's going to be the designer. And the retoucher, the retoucher is going to touch up your images. If you don't like to Photoshop, this is definitely going to help. 
the designer to design all the stuff that we're going to order from Zeno. And then we have our software to share, which is going to be the gallery and the slideshow. So I can share my images with the couple. They can then share it with their family. And we have the e-store if they want to purchase anything directly through the store. One of the biggest benefits of the basic plan uh, through the gallery or through the slideshow is going to be savings. You're going to save 25% off select products with the plans. And if you guys want to get a picture, these are some of the options that you save 25% on. You're not limited to these, but we do also have these on display you guys, if you want to check them out. And if you want to scan the barcode that's in front of you, we're doing 50% off the software for the duration of the show only. And you can also get a pre-made album shipped directly to your address. And if you guys want to connect, if you guys have any questions on anything that you saw, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, feel free to send me a message if you have any questions or if you need help with anything, and I'll be happy to help you guys out. And thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you, Martin. I hope you guys enjoy this and learn what to put in your bag. Thank you for sticking around and hanging out and watching us and watching this guy talk about what's in his bag. If you haven't uh, used us before, just want to let you know that this is our 10th year anniversary as a company. We are an album lab. So if you go right on over there, you can see exactly what we have to offer. Not in addition to that, as Martin has pointed out, we have a lot of software options. So if you look at our QR codes that's right in front of your seat and on some billboards over there, you can get 50% off of our software. And with that subscription, you also get 25% off select products, as you, you might have heard from Martin. And it, please go on, check us out, ask us any questions, stick around, ask this guy questions. I'll be and here. thank you for attending. Thanks. Tomorrow, he'll be talking about how to use the software. So we will be putting up the schedules and on the video right here so he can see what we have going on tomorrow. Thank you.